Welcome back. So, uh, this was the last uh, slide. Now, historical liquefaction features from Kutch. So, this this is one uh, uh, kind of uh, investigations uh, which we do to look for uh, the past signatures or the signatures of the past earthquake or liquefaction preserved in the sediment successions. So, this was the trench which we did in 1999 and maybe before that 1996 or 98 and what we found was this sand blows here, this is a typical sand blow and uh, deformational features. Okay. So, convolutions. So, this convolutions are also considered as a load structures or uh, and folding in the uh, very fine sediments and this happens because of strong ground shaking and sand blow which I was explaining in the last previous slide is because of the strong uh, ground shaking, increasing pore water pressure and uh, releasing the liquefiable sand at the surface. So, we also call this as an pseudo nodules and these are typically the sand blows. Now, uh, uh, this is one table which we have prepared, uh, which talks about the intensity values and descriptions. And this is after the uh, uh, the, the intensity scale is also being given here. So one, three, and uh, two and three, and so on, which talks about that what will be the uh, the approximate ground acceleration. So. Uh, if you are having for example, the intensity uh, 4 here, then the peak ground acceleration will be around 0 0.03 to 0 0.04 g. But the, the issue or the, the where we should bother is mainly somewhere over here, that is if you are having the intensity of ground shaking in 7 and then it reaches 0.1 to 0.15 g and this is what happens and mainly most of us will experience that we will have damage will be negligible in the building, but yes of course everybody will be will be the shaking will force us to run outdoors. So, if the building is good build design then the, the damage will be negligible, but light to moderate in the wall built ordinary structure if you are having and then if you have for example, the peak ground acceleration above 0 0.5 and then more than 0 0.6 g, then you, you may experience that well bit woolen structures will also be destroyed, most machinery and frame structure destroyed with foundations. So, this will result into the major damage and of course, if you are having greater than 0 0.60, then you will have a major damage or total damage in that case. So, liquefaction possibility depends upon uh, the thickness of beds as I was talking in uh, the previous slide and that is mainly a function of peak ground acceleration. So, suppose we are having the uh, the thickness, this is what we, we were talking about the H1 and H2. So, you have like units, unit 1 you are having and then you are having the electrifiable unit and then you are having another one here. So, if the electrifiable unit is sandwiched between the non electrifiable unit, and what happens? So, this is your liquefiable sand, this is your H2 and this is your H1. So, H1 is your uh, liquefiable, a uh, non liquefiable unit and this is your H1, H2 is your liquefiable. So, H1 is non liquefiable low permeability layer ok 
capping the probable unit flexible unit that is your h2 so h2 is your flexible layer now if the thickness of your h1 this is an over lying unit is higher okay that is your capping unit is more uh, so more ground acceleration will be required to liquefy the h2 unit so we have for example we have very ideal conditions that this is cohesionless and also it is water saturated but if the thickness of h1 is larger or thicker then you require much more ground acceleration so the ground acceleration which will be required if you are having thickness for example 8 meter or so then you have uh, the maximum ground acceleration which will be required will be approximately around 0.4 to 0.5 g so this is another important part so what uh, the geotechnical engineers and the geophysicists and geologists they do is that they will have uh, they will take the borehole and then try to study the deposit shear so based on this they will conclude whether this unit will liquefy uh, at the time of the earthquake from a particular source so they also need to know that what will be the peak ground acceleration at the site of interest this is another uh, trench which it did in uh, uh, the great run of kutch which also showed us that not all liquefiable units or the uh, the uh, the units were they been able to reach or break the surface so this example if you see here is a very tiny sand blow which was unable to reach right up to the surface but it deformed the the units overlying it and just stop there so this is another uh, uh, example other than that what we found was a very interesting micro faulting in this region so this type of deformations also will be seen in most of the places where one either the thickness is quite large there is an overlying thickness of the bed which will not be able to liquefy and another point is that i i was talking about the dimension of the liquefaction features so if the magnitude is less then you may not have the the large uh, liquefaction features as i we were looking in one of the uh, the site in great run of kutch so this is an sand dike and then this portion which is in marked here is your sand drape and this is your micro faulting area so there's a close up of that which you can easily make out that this portion has moved down with respect to the side walls here and there is some down faulting the normal force which can be seen here so there's another normal fault here another normal fault here so typically this un unit is horizontally laminated unit so micro faulting in bunny um, sediments so if such such uh, uh, phenomena happens and we have the micro faulting we have uh, small sand dikes and the sand blows of course this will disturb in terms of the shear strength so the material uh, will lose the shear strength and you may have uh, or you may experience the the collapsing of your structure which is sitting on the surface so people have done the uh, the studies which also shows uh, the uh, the pre 2001 earthquake signatures in terms of the liquefaction then another very common phenomena uh, which usually is observed is of lateral spreading and then lateral spreading can also or i would say that it can even occur 
if you are having a slope of around 2 degree also or even less than that. So the main process which is involved in lateral spreading is your liquefaction. But since it is the material is sitting along the slope, it will slide down or the blocks will, the, because of the fracturing, the blocks will float on the liquefiable sand. So lateral spreading, what we see is that we have, uh, it is because of the again the cyclic processes as we were talk, talking about the shear stress results into the back and forth movement within the sediment column. So you will have a back and forth uh, movement within the sediment column and this is the potential unit uh, which will liquefy. This is the unliquefiable unit or non-liquefiable unit, but this will of course will fracture and this blocks will float on the on surface and the separation point will be your fractures which will develop or the fissures which will develop because of the breaking up of this blocks on the surface. So increase in pore water pressure, densification will take place and that will result into sudden movement of large sediment blocks causing lateral spread. So this will start moving in a, in its uh, the, uh, along the gradient or the slope and result into the complete landslide also. Okay. So lateral spread will also can also result into the landslide in many of the regions. So example, this is from uh, um, again Seattle, Washington, DC. I am unable to play the movie here, but we can put it later on. So there is an example of lateral spread here, which was triggered in 2001 on 20th of February 2001 because of the earthquake in, in Seattle. And the displacement which was been observed over here was around 1.5 to 2 meters. Now coming to the Kutch region, so this was the, the area which was been marked as a zone of uh, the epicentral zone. The rupture did not come right up to the surface, but of course what we feel is that there was a surface deformation which uh, accompanied the, uh, the ground shaking. And the area over here, we did trenching and then did detailed survey in this region which showed us the zone of lateral spreading. So, uh, if I take the cross section here, probably next slide we have the cross section, but if you take the cross section here, this is my south, this is north, then this is a very gently sloping surface here. So, this is my south and this is my north here and the sediments here, this is in close to the bunny plain and this is in rocky uh, uh, mainland and this portion is mostly covered by a loose sediments. So this portion slipped over here. So what we did was we studied this whole area in detail and tried to understand that what exactly happened at the time of the earthquake and whether this was the uh, what we say is the co-seismic rupture or this was a purely lateral spreading. Now when we say liquefaction and lateral spreading, then this goes as in secondary features. These are not the primary one. Primary one is the co-seismic rupture that is the displacement which is coming right up to the surface along the along the fall. But this one will be in side effects. Okay. So these are all secondary. Co-seismic will be close to the fault, but this can happen like lateral spreading or liquefaction, they can take place quite far. It may cover more than 200 kilometers of the area and if there is an ideal condition you will face a liquefaction. So what we keep uh, talking about that if uh, 
even though we are sitting like far away from uh, the himalaya if you are even sitting in the indo-gangetic plain and the distance is not much maybe around 200 to 250 kilometers then we are likely to be hit by the liquefaction so we did the aerial uh, uh, survey here and we found a very prominent east west aligned ridge lines here very small ridge lines and of course it was bit difficult to differentiate between the the agricultural uh, field boundaries and the uh, and, and the recently formed uh, this ridge lines because of the 2001 bhuj earthquake but yes we flew very low and then we took uh, very close photographs aerial photographs to understand this so what we found was at this area it, this is your uh, north uh, sorry south and this side is north so we are looking towards south from the the aircraft so what we found that this area the southern part was shows as extension and the northern part at the toe of the the slope break we were able to see uh, the deformation so if you if i take the cross section here it looks something like this okay. so what we found was that there were extensional cracks here and this land completely moved down and then was bulldozed on on the surface so this is typical of uh, the lateral spread and the landslide and we also say this as an rotational landslide so this is uh, the north from so from south we mapped all cracks or the fissures which were been developed in in the zone of almost 1 km and this was the maximum uh, deformation which we were able to pick up so the bold lines which has been shown is your uh, the uh, the linear bulges bulges which were been formed and this were the open cracks uh, the fissures which were developed and the slope is in this direction it is in this direction towards north so the uh, we have uh, uh, the profiles topographic profiles which we took across this so ab and cd and what we found is this one okay so we have the ab is here so we see this as an uplift zone so this is your uh, south and this is your north and same is over here so we found in ab what we found is the uplift zone and then few sand dikes or over there or the artificial dikes and then depression whereas over here we found that there was an extension in the southern side this is your south this is your north here and the slope was not so much okay so if you take the slope here it will be something like this and slope was not much then also this slipped because the condition were very ideal to have this type of uh, deformation secondary deformation so the pressure ridge or the the bulges which were formed because of the movement of this uh, mass so close up of this if you see uh, this it looks like something like this so very thin fissures or the fractures which were formed and this are all extensional fractures so if you look at here what happened basically is that this area opened up so there is an extension and then this portion came as an compression here because of the, the material which moved to the Uh, on the flat surface so close up of this one extensional cracks and the bulges which were been formed now the 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 issue will be that suppose if you were having a building here sitting on top of this and it must have it could have been damaged because of the the bulging which has been seen here now cross section of the bulge if you see what we found was something like this okay so we have the extension here in the southern side and we have the bulging so this the this the material moved or was bulldozed on the present surface 
So some people thought that this is a primary uh, or the co-seismic uh, rupture, but when we did the detailed survey, we found that this is nothing to do with the primary rupture, but this was a secondary phenomenon. And we also observed at some location, this is because of the extension, this the, the water ditch which was or the small canal which was also laterally shifted over here. So, these are the two piercing point of this one, this got laterally shifted along this fracture. Again, this was nothing to do with the primary one, so, this moved like that and this moved in this direction. So, this was a lateral shift, right lateral shift here. Even the pound boundaries were also it moved because of the lateral shift and it was typical uh, deformation which was observed in the money plane. The same photograph, aerial photograph showing the extensional. Now, this is an effect from 1995 Kobe earthquake. Again, the magnitude was not so large, but yes, of course, the damage which was been experienced during 1995 and 1964 Niigata earthquake was massive because of the liquefaction. So, these are some uh, pictures which shows the effect of the liquefaction and the tilting of the building, complete tilt because of the loss of shear strength of the liquefiable soil. This is from 1964 Niigata, another picture of other similar phenomena. So, this is the relationship between the magnitude and the occurrence of liquefaction evidence. As I was talking about that, we can look at the old liquefaction features and even try to understand that which area had a maximum intensity or the impact because of the liquefaction. So, this was another exercise done by one of the team uh, uh, after 2001 Hojo earthquake, looking at the dimension of the, uh, the features. So, this is the sand blow thickness one okay. and even the along with the thickness, what type of features were been formed, either it was crater, the lateral spread or the cracks or the tear falls or the fracturing, slumping, grabbing or that is the depression which have been formed. So, if you if you come close to the previous like slide which I was showing, this area was having a very large features, the dimension was almost 25, uh, also this is a sand thickness, okay. but as they moved away from the epicenter, okay, the size reduced. So, this is another advantage which one can take and then type of uh, features which will be experienced or observed uh, in the epicentral area. So, this is a relationship which talks about that the moment magnitude which has been given on the y axis here and then maximum distance to surface manifestation of the liquefaction. So, how far you can expect the the liquefaction features, if you are having in particular magnitude triggered in the region. So, even if you are sitting away, this is what I was talking about. So, this is a logarithmic scale which shows that the, so 7.6 was or 7.7 .7 was your uh, 2001 Kuch earthquake. So, what one can expect if the ideal condition prevail that you will have a liquefaction features more than 200 kilometers away you can you can experience. So, this is an documented liquefaction which was observed up to 150 kilometers within the, uh, the filled star and then the another one is the well, white star you are having count of liquefaction near Ahmedabad which is sitting almost 250 kilometers and this was the farthest near Hyderabad that is 
300 kilometers. So, uh, we also did one small exercise after 2005 Kashmir earthquake or you can say Muzaffarabad earthquake, the epicenter was in Pakistan, the magnitude was 6, 7.6. So, uh, when we were doing field somewhere in the close region, uh, we found that there was a news talking about that there is a liquefaction or fissures or the cracks which were formed close to Jammu. So, we immediately uh, went there and then did a very small one day field work to look for the liquefaction features. So, we also observed some cracks or the openings which developed in pakka houses and then typical fissured sand blows which were been observed close to the river bank of Tavi and these are very small sand blows here and very deep crack which was also observed and then what we found was this crack was uh, was along the, the boundary wall of uh, a pond and this is typical of the lateral spread. So, when we compared with the magnitude again uh, the location of uh, the Jammu from the, uh, the epicenter was almost 240 kilometers. So, this is what we say the farthest recorded liquefaction during 2005 Mujafrabad or Kashmir earthquake. So, what I can do is I could stop here and maybe we will continue in the next lecture talking about monitoring seismic activities. Thank you so much.